Hello, my name is Alan Winthrop. I'm a principal counselling psychologist working in the areas of specialist pain management, chronic fatigue syndrome and head and neck cancer psychology. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about understanding pain. It's important to realise that pain is a normal process. Pain has a protective function and it is the attempt of our bodies to protect us further. We know that if, for instance, you're twisting your arm, you get a level of pain at a certain point that tells you not to go any further, that pain normally is protective. Now, what happens when our brain thinks that we're in a dangerous or difficult situation is that it can keep giving us strong messages of pain in an attempt to protect us. And one of the ways of thinking about pain is to see our brain as a potentially well-meaning but sometimes misguided friend who attempts to give us a message telling us to stop when actually we may not need to stop at that point in time. What's really important is to understand that tissue damage does not relate to the level of pain that we may experience. We know this, for instance, by looking at people who've sustained gunshots or horrific stab wounds or injuries in wars and battles, and they're often totally unaware of the fact that they've been injured. Now, if pain relied entirely on what was happening to our physical body, then we would experience pain immediately at that level. It's also of interest that when we've interviewed people who've survived shark bites, they often, really surprisingly, describe feeling very little at the time, often describing they felt a slight tug or even using the word a bump against their arm or leg, when in fact their arm or leg has been bitten off. So we know immediately that pain does not just rely on what's happening at a physical level in the tissues of our bodies. The same is also true where people have sustained horrific amputation injuries. They often don't describe those injuries themselves as painful at the time. Another example that clearly shows to us that the level of tissue injury we sustain is not what leads to the amount of pain we feel is the example of the construction worker. This is a case study that was written up in a British medical journal. Basically a construction worker was working on a site and as he was coming down a ladder he stood on a very large masonry nail. The nail went up through the sole of his boot and came out through the top of his boot. The construction worker was understandably in agony. An ambulance was called, he was given really strong pain relief. And when he arrived at the hospital, any attempt to move or assess the nail would produce crippling, agonizing pain. When the boot was cut away, it was revealed that actually the nail had passed in the gap between his big toe and other toes. There was no injury at all to his foot, not even a scratch. Yet he was in very real agonizing pain. So the takeaway from this is to understand that in the end, it is our brain that 100% determines the level of pain we will or won't experience in a given situation. And the brain uses lots of other factors and context to provide you with that message. It is not solely related to damage sustained to our body. You may have heard the words acute pain. Acute pain refers to pain what we often feel after surgery or after an injury when the body is healing. And usually acute pain serves a normal protective function and lasts for around three months. However, if after the body has healed and the injury is long gone, we still experience pain, we tend to call this persistent pain. Persistent pain is where we're receiving messages of pain based on the brain having a different neural pathway, even though the body has healed from the original injury. You may have also heard of referred pain now, referred pain is where we feel pain, say, for example, in our knee, 
but the actual issue that may be causing us a problem might be located in our hip. Or we may be feeling pain in our arm, but again, the actual problem is maybe a nerve in our spinal column. So really what this shows us is often where we think we have pain and the level of pain or tissue damage are all just one factor that plays into how our brain determines the amount of pain we're in. You may have also heard of phantom pain. This is where people who've had breasts or limbs removed still experience pain in those limbs or breasts. Now we know physically that's not possible because they're no longer there. They have been surgically removed. However, that doesn't stop the pain giving us messages in those areas. So when thinking about pain, you may have heard people using the word nociceptive or neuropathic pain to describe your pain experiences. What this means is in nociceptive pain, it's referring to certain type of receptors in the body that detect types of pain. We usually experience nociceptive pain as dull, aching and throbbing. Neuropathic pains tend to follow nerve pathways and we experience pain as sharp, stinging, tingling, burning. People often describe it as like electrical shocks running through them or they describe a sensation of people pouring hot or cold water on the part of their body that they can feel the pain in. Many times we have mixed nociceptive and neuropathic pain. We don't just have one type or another. What's really important when thinking about pain is that we also include pain in terms of emotional pain, pain in terms of grief, loss, bereavement, that we use the word pain to describe a wide range of unpleasant sensory and emotional experiences, not just a sharp stabbing or a dull aching pain. When talking about pain with cancer, then people could be experiencing pain from tumours, invading tissues of the body or causing increased pressure on nerves in the body. They may be experiencing pain from having had surgery and also pain from some of the treatments that are involved. So what it's important to realise is that more people are surviving cancer and living longer with cancer. And what this means is that more people may be living with a persistent form of pain as well as a result of their cancer or cancer treatment. So living with persistent pain can cause irritability, frustration, anger, anxiety, depression, sleep problems, relationship and intimacy issues, and it can often lead us to withdraw more from people and from those that we love around us. It can also stop us doing more activities, and gradually it can lead to us becoming more and more anxious or depressed, or more reclusive and not taking part in social occasions. So, you may have heard people talking about pain cycles. One of the main things that occurs with pain is what we call the cycle of pain and avoidance. What happens when we feel something as painful is we tend to do less. So, for instance, if we're walking and we find that it's actually causing us more pain, we may decide not to walk as much, not to walk as far, Unfortunately, as a result of doing less and less, our body then enters into a, a form of progressive deconditioning. And so our body gets less and less fit and less and less used to functioning in the way it did previously. As a result of being more deconditioned, we then experience pain at lower levels of activity. And so we see it's a vicious cycle going round and round of pain leading to less activity, which leads to progressive deconditioning of our body and pain at lower levels of activity, which leads to more avoidance. And so the cycle keeps on going. So sometimes when people are stuck in this cycle and are going round and round repeatedly, it becomes more like a spiral with the person becoming more and more deconditioned and more and more sensitized to pain as time goes on. Now one of the other cycles that's often talked about relates to what's happening with our mood. That if we're very angry 
very anxious or very depressed about the pain that we're in, then obviously this distress lowers our mood. And as our mood becomes lower over time, we also then experienced increased pain perception. So when we have a low mood or a highly anxious mood, then we feel pain more. And because we're feeling pain more, it lowers our mood further. And so the cycle goes round and round. So one of the ways of thinking about pain as a whole approach is to look at what's called the holistic pain model. The holistic pain model looks at our behaviours, our thoughts, the environment, our mood and our physiology. The behavioural aspects of this are where we actually think, what are we doing? Are we pushing ourselves, doing too much? Do we know that if we do that job in the garden that it's going to give us an incredible amount of pain but we do it anyway? Or do we think, could I break parts of that job down and just do a little bit for now? So our behaviour has a big impact on what happens to our pain. With our thoughts, what we think about ourselves, what we think about other people, and what we think about the world in general are all very important factors. If we're thinking that we're useless, that we can't do things, if we're very self-critical, very perfectionistic about what we think we should or shouldn't be doing, then those thoughts can get in the way of us being sensible with our pain management and can actually lead us to keep doing behaviours that are making our pain worse. So when we think about our environment, we literally mean the environment we're in. So are we in a safe environment? Are our basic needs met? You know, are factors relating to housing, domestic violence, are any of those things relevant to us? Do we live in a safe environment? Environment also leads us to think about aids and adaptations which might, which might help us. Like, do we have a stair lift if we need a stair lift? Do we use a rollator to help us walk around? Do we use crutches? Do we have a grabber? Do we have grab rails fitted? Do we have a toilet riser? Any adaptations that would allow us to manage our pain and live as independently as possible within our environment. Are we using environmental support? In terms of our mood, if we're very depressed or highly anxious or feeling very angry all the time as a result of pain, then we may need to address this. It may help for us to have talking therapies, to look at ways of managing anxiety or depression or anger and other factors that can influence our mood. And then physiology, we may feel we don't have a great deal that we can do to alter what's happening in the tissues or biochemistry of our body, but it's important that we realise that physiology is also one of the factors that plays into our perception of pain. So, in addition to understanding the holistic model and looking at what we can do with our behaviour, our thoughts, our environment, the mood, physiology of the situation, we can also look at managing our pain by trying to prioritise those activities and people around us that are very important to us. So we can prioritise what we feel we really need to do that gives us a benefit and is something that we value. And how can we do what we call in pain management, pacing. Now pacing is an activity that involves us doing small amounts of manageable activities at levels that don't cause us too much pain. So it might be that instead of doing a whole job that needs done around the home or in the garden, we do small parts. We break things down and decide that maybe over the course of a week we'll do very small paced amounts of activity. So what's important is that we prioritise to us. What's really important here? What do we feel we need to keep doing and keep involved with? In addition to, to pacing, it's really important in pain to keep moving and to keep some motion going. Even if that just means all we do every hour is get up, if possible, and stretch or move around. Even if we can't get up unaided, we can still potentially clench and relax and move parts of our body that will help us in keeping moving. We also need to look at how we can help ourselves relax. 
learning relaxation, listening to downloadable apps on our telephones that help us look at relaxation. We need to look at how we can reduce the stress in our life. We need to look at our sleep hygiene. You know, creating a good routine around going to bed, trying to sleep, getting up at the regular times, creating a pattern because often with pain, sleep is difficult and disturbed. So we need to try and get our sleep patterns as normal as possible. We may use medication. Now medication is often useful for acute pain, but at times is actually less useful for the more longer term persistent pain. But medication is another area that we may need help to optimize our medication, to help us get sleep at night, or to deal with some of the levels of pain that we're experiencing. It's also really important to keep social contact with people, to keep up our friendship circles and relatives, particularly with those people that we feel are helpful and supportive of us. You may also hear some people talk about the use of mindfulness as a way of helping people with pain. There will be resources available on the website to explain more about mindfulness, but mindfulness is an awareness, a paying attention in a very particular way, in the moment, to what's occurring within and around us. It's a skill that needs to be developed and practiced regularly. So if we're aware of pain in a certain part of our body, we may pay attention in a very particular way. Instead of just saying, I'm in pain, I'm feeling pain here, we may try and step back slightly and say, I'm noticing that I'm experiencing some pain, or I notice this. It's, it's a way of trying to step back and have some awareness of what's going on, rather than being totally wrapped up in the whole situation at that point in time. Now, these skills do need to be developed and practiced regularly, but there are many apps and support systems on websites to help you look at developing mindfulness skills. Okay, and remember, you're not alone in dealing with these experiences. We're always here for you. We're available at the hospital. You can contact your GP and primary care services. And there are a number of resources available for you. Don't hesitate to contact us if you'd like further help or assistance. Thank you for listening.